Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 6 AI Innovators. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto along with Dave Vellante all day bringing in all the top players in the AI, generative AI industry from infrastructure, software, application development, all building out the next gen AI at large scale. Aran Khan, a CEO, co-founder of Chair is here, CUBE alumni, great to see you. Welcome back to our AI Innovators and congratulations. You guys are doing a lot of innovative things in particular, the world spun directly into your direction, as we had predicted in the last time you were in theCUBE, so thanks for coming on. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you again, John. So excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit more about what we're seeing in the generative AI space. You know, I love I love the term luck. I, I believe that luck is playing, it plays a big factor. Luck is preparation meets opportunity. You guys really at the right place at the right time with the right team. Obviously, last time when you chatted on theCUBE, we were talking about cost optimization and all that good stuff. Now everything's generative AI, and now that is the number one conversation right now on how much am I going to spend? Is the, ju is the juice worth the squeeze? That's the question. Everyone knows they want generative AI, but the question is how do they get that? So what are you guys thinking? How are you seeing this spending challenge or opportunity with generative AI? How are you, you guys seeing this play out? Of course, it's probably impacting your business, but what do you see happening? No, absolutely. Well, one of the key things that we're seeing in the space right now is that folks are starting to realize the benefits of generative AI, really from a cost perspective and from a revenue perspective. And, you know, just things like what we've seen with Klarna, replacing a good chunk of their customer success costs with something that's much lower cost in a production generative AI model is, I think, the tip of the iceberg. But what customers are starting to realize is that you know, the science, the best practices, they're only about a year old. And the hardware space is constantly changing. Look, you've got the H100, H200, B100, all coming out in the span of the next few months. Who knows what the next generation state-of-the-art model is going to require? And who knows what the actual cost to serve these models once they get product market fit and reach production is going to look like. And I think that that uncertainty is something that's universal across the customers that we talk to when they're looking to do their one year, three year plus commitments to their cloud provider and figure out how much of this capacity from a GPU standpoint or from a high end, you know, ASIC standpoint, like Inferentia or TPU, should I plan to actually be spending on as we experiment, go through POCs and ideally get to a place where we can scale something up that's making real production top line or bottom line impact. I want to get into your business. I know you guys are doing extremely well. Not sure you can talk about revenue numbers, but I know you've got a series B financing going on right now. You guys are, again, right on the, on the growth curve. What are some of the business metrics that's impacting your, your revenue in terms of customer adoption? What are, what are people looking to spend on? I'll see how they procure uh, compute and, and GPUs are changing and the platforms are changing. And, you know, Jensen says it's a software world now. I mean, Kamada is going over to almost zero cost for compute and GPUs in the future. That's, that's the premise. Where software now is the value. So what, what do you, what's driving your business? Give us a, a feel for um, some of the revenue. What's in your yeah. pitch deck, I should ask you. Absolutely. Uh, well, look, I think we've been really fortunate to come out with the right product at the right time, as you said. So what our Chera does is we're completely free cost optimization platform. We have customers who save millions of dollars a year with us on AWS and now Azure, I don't pay us a single penny. And we love that, that's customer obsession. And where we make our money is in providing a first of its kind new insurance offering for cloud commitments, which is as simple as saying is if you commit to three years to run this GPU machine with AWS and you only end up using two of it, we'll pay for the one, we're on the hook there. And so what we've seen in our space as we've gone to market and really in our first year going to market, we basically 10 X our revenue is that customers are hungry for something like this because of the risk inherent in committing to anything in a space that moves as quickly as generative AI. The chips move quickly, the services you're committing to and software stacks, as you mentioned, move quickly and customers want to move fast at a great cost, but not lock themselves into something that might not be the right solution for them one year, let alone one month yeah. down the line. What's your vision for as the, first of all, by the way, that's absolutely accurate. You're seeing two things happen that's coming out of this super cloud event. One is the organic growth of developer appetite for building on top of uh, infrastructure for Gen AI. And two, enterprises bringing their corporate data to the table, which by the way, it's not that easy to just 
integrate that into a bottoms up. You need, a, you need to bring them both together. You're seeing enterprises trying to go as fast as they can while the infrastructure is changing so fast. In other words, it's evolving, which means it's changing constantly. So there's a lot of risk on making a decision that could foreclose the future. Absolutely, and I think that it, it's a multi-tiered problem because the generative AI, the fancy stuff with the GPUs, you know, to really make that useful in the context of your business, you've got to get your data strategy right. Heck, in some cases, you've got to even get your data to the cloud in the first place so you can use those platforms like Amazon EMR or Databricks or Snowflake to start extracting value out of those data sets that are proprietary to your business and really are the moat to the generative AI that you build that powers your business on a top line or bottom line basis. So I think there's risks at every piece of the stack that needs to be built to support Gen AI and CIOs are starting to really realize this as are their counterparts on the finance side, which is where a product like ours that's really blending that insurance aspect with deep technical and cost optimization knowledge can really make an impact in the customers we work with. It's an interesting dilemma because if you don't move fast enough with AI, you could be left behind. If you move too fast, you could make a suboptimal decision on infrastructure. So timing is everything on this wave. I mean, it literally is. If you miss, misfire, you could be driftwood. On the other side, if you're too late, you missed the wave. So interesting uh, dynamic. How do you guys see this playing out from a use case perspective? Because obviously your success is based on the fact that there's demand for uh, Gen AI infrastructure. And two, they don't want to pay for something they're not going to sure they're going to use. So what are they doing? What are your customers doing with Gen AI? How are they approaching it? Um, are they more on the app dev side? Are they looking for a hedge against costs on infrastructure? What do you see there? What's the power dynamics for, for your success? Absolutely. Well, now we're tracking billions of dollars of annualized cloud spend against hundreds and hundreds of customers that work with us, ranging from some of the largest enterprises to fast moving generative AI startups and everyone in between. And I'd say that the kind of most common thing I've seen is that people are experimenting with generative AI, but the very earliest minority are really putting it out into product uh, or into internal processes and getting really large ROI from it. We're kind of in that earliest of adopters phase uh, where folks are going from, hey, this new technology exists, where can I apply it to? A POC has been run, we've seen a really great ROI, and now we're scaling it across our customer base or across our you know, internal teams in a very specific way. Uh, obviously, we saw the uh, reporting from Klarna, which was kind of an example down on the internal side. But look at folks like... Um, Explain you know, that Mid example real quick. Explain that example real quick. A absolutely. So uh, Klarna reported in their earnings that they were able to replace a significant fraction of the volume going to their you know, human-based support team with responses from a generative AI-based model. And I think across the customers that we're looking at, particularly large enterprises, uh, that's been a really great beachhead along with software development and code generation for this generative AI to make real dollars and cents ROI impact. Now, compared to the organizations that we work with who actually do generative AI to drive top line revenue as part of a growth driver for their business, you know, the usage that we're seeing from the internal example is actually much smaller. And the customers who are really leading the pack here from a spend perspective are the ones who've gone through the training, figured out what model works for them. Think of like an Adobe with a Firefly. Hey, this thing really works, makes the workflows better, or a Microsoft with a Copilot. And now they're starting to contract real revenue against it. And with that revenue and usage growth, their inference spend starts to scale with the number of customers they have. And you know what I'm looking at in our customer base as an indicator for if someone has really made that kind of product market fit transition with generative AI is, are they really projecting forward that their inference spend is going to surpass their training spend and their R&D spend on these models? And I'd say a very small proportion of our customers are there today, but over the course of 2024, I think a larger number of customers will probably get into that early majority of customers starting to really get to that point from a spend perspective. So you're seeing in your customer base, both cost optimization and revenue growth. Correct. Um, you know, the cost optimization is obviously coming from different places yeah. where the revenue is growing, but the, you know, the, the broad strokes is that budgets are growing, not as much as they did say in 2021 or 2022. Uh, but a lot of that is going towards these generative AI initiatives. And 
the dollars that are coming back from cost saving on your traditional kind of web serving workloads or database workloads, those are getting reinvested back into these Gen AI efforts. So uh, I think that's been the common thread of the last quarter, quarter and a half. Okay, so let me play the role of a customer, then I'm going to play the role of a VC, because I know you're doing a funding round, so I'll ask you a few questions on that little uh, funding side. But first, first, I'm a customer, pretend I'm a customer. Love what you're saying, I'm in. My number one concern is I want to make sure that the money I'm saving and, and or the money I'm gaining, which is net benefit, has to be more than my cost. So do I come to you and lock that in? How do you help me? Do you come in with a, like a TCO calculator? I mean, because I want to make, I want to make sure I'm not overspending to get that savings. Take me through that use case. Absolutely. So it's one of the really unique things that we as our chair provide as part of our free platform is a full scenario modeling tool where you can go in, pick any stack of services from AWS, from any of their marketplace vendors, and figure out in you know, some scenarios what the cost of that, including things like your commitments, like RIs and savings plans, or things like our insured versions of RIs and savings plans, what things like an enterprise discount or credits layered on top figures into as a total cost of ownership. And you can do this before you even run the Terraform template or click through the console and spin up that instance. And customers love that because they're able to understand and go to their management with some of these very expensive, you know, first box of the project type SKUs to spin up that might have 24 GPUs attached and really get that clarity in terms of what's going to hit the AWS bill at the end of the day, who's going to own it, and then what can we do to reduce the cost and the risk of running this workload, be it, you know, buying a three-year commitment if you're sure you're going to use the H100 for the next three years, or buying an insured version from us that gives you the flexibility in case the technology changes. And so I think that's been one of the key things that we've seen with our customers as a huge requirement now that the barrier to entry of any new project is 10X what it was uh, before this generative AI boom. What's great about your company is you're actually on the growth curve doing a series B financing. You're on the upslope, um, good funding round for companies like yourself, so I'm sure you're Got a lot of action going on. So I'm the VC, what's in it for me? What's the investment thesis? Uh, what are you promising? What are you looking at that's going to be the key driver? Revenue growth, customer acquisition? What are the key metrics? What, what's the key highlights of your fundraising deck? Well, well, all of the above. I think one of the key things that we're seeing is that you know, as this model has been validated uh, within the customers that we've worked with in North America, internationally customers are knocking on the door as our partners. Beyond that, larger and larger customers are starting to knock on the door, uh, including some large Fortune 500s. We're starting to understand, hey, this is, you know, if I'm insuring my biggest line item, which is my employee's <laughs> health insurance, my second biggest line item is cloud. Shouldn't I be insuring that as well? Um, and obviously we're looking to add more products, uh, both from what we insure, as well as new SaaS products and new products for our partners to go to market with them more effectively. And we're already working with some of the largest and most important MSPs and uh, global partners of AWS. And I think we want to do more of that over time. So all of that is in the service of growing the business and taking this vision of commitments for cloud insurance really to the broadest market possible. And that's really everyone using the cloud today. The last minute we have left, um, I'll give you the floor, share a quick plug for what you're looking to hire. Uh, so you're doing a fundraising round, so good luck with that. Thanks for that share and that, uh, that, that pitch there. What, what are you looking to hire? What's the stats? Uh, put a plug in for your vision. No, absolutely. Well, we're hiring for amazing engineers who know the cloud well. We're hiring for great salespeople who've come from the cloud or the broader channel ecosystem. And we're also going to be hiring for executives on the finance side as we grow that side of our operations. So, uh, you know, we're looking for amazing people wherever we can find them. And I think one of the key things that uh, I'd love to talk to customers about as we get into this year is figuring out how to budget for generative AI. We're looking for more customers who are interested in this idea of insurance for GPUs, for their cloud commitments. And uh, we're very excited to have more conversations as the space develops and as we see kind of the technologies and the trend shift. It's its own financial economy right now, this GPUs. It's, uh, you know, you definitely got to be and, and some good action going on. Thanks for coming on, I appreciate it. And thanks for the, the contribution as part of our SuperCloud 6 and participating in our AI innovators. Absolutely, thanks for having me, John. It's good right. to see you again. Yeah. Take care. Okay, that's SuperCloud 6. We'll be right back with more all day here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante and our team. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break.